Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. We'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, we'd love love to hear from you how you uh, heard about today's webinar, where you found out about us, and um, also where you're listening from today. It would be great if we could uh, get to know you a little bit more. Um, feel free to use the chat box as we get going here. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, we'll make sure that all of your questions get answered by the end of the presentation. My name is Braden Knutson, and I'll be your host for this webinar. We'd like to remind everyone that these webinars are being recorded and posted onto our BYU Family History Library website as well as onto our YouTube channel uh, where you can subscribe and receive notifications of all the new videos that get uploaded and um, stay up to date on on your family history research. Um, today we'll be pleased to hear from James Tanner who will be giving a presentation titled um, Beginning English Research Introduction to the Records. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligent analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. So we'll turn the time over to James now and let him take this. Why am I getting into a paper center? There we go. Howdy, this is James Tanner. We're back for another webinar in our series from the Brigham Young University Family History Library on the BYU campus in Provo, Utah. Uh, we, all of these, as uh, Braden said, all of these uh, broadcasts are being recorded and will be put up for review on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And uh, if you subscribe to our channel, then they'll notify you when the new videos go up. We're going to talk about beginning English research and a little bit of the introduction of the records. Obviously, in an hour presentation, we uh, have to kind of skim across the top, but we'll uh, give you a little overview of what's going on with English records and some, um, some of the ideas. Uh, first of all, I think it's pretty important uh, to, to know a little bit of the history. Now, why is this important for genealogists? Um, well, it's interesting because genealogists are really looking at historical records and they sort of fit into their category of historical researchers. Um, we're not quite trying to reconstruct what happened at different battles in the ancient times, except it's helpful. Sometimes we have to actually get into that so we can figure out if our, our ancestor was the guy that got shot in that particular battle or not. Uh, so it, 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 there is really a very close relationship between genealogy and, and the uh, practice of historical research. So uh, one of the things that really happens that's kind of sad is that, uh, that some genealogists kind of ignore the idea of history and of knowing what's going on with the history of the country. And uh, I can remember a class I had uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, there were six people who were, you know, your average uh, educated American adults. And uh, we were talking about records and, and things that uh, to look for on a certain family. And, and the family that we were talking about at the time, uh, uh, the husband had lived during the uh, 1860s in the United States. And uh, so I looked at the class and I said, well, OK, now what does that tell you? If he was uh, 25 years old in 1860, what, what do we need to look for? And uh, they sort of stared at me. And, and I said, well, OK, uh, what happened in the 1860s in the United States? And they all just sat there. And I said, no, no, you're pl are you trying to, are you just, don't be afraid. Just tell me what you think. And they all just sat there. And I said, OK, 62 to 66, 67. You know, what's happened around that time? They go, anyways, had you ever heard of the American Civil War? Oh, really? Is that when that happened? Oh, yes, OK. And. Uh, Anyway, so I said, you know, this is really a problem because uh, what happens in the country is what determines to a great extent what, where you're going to start looking for records and what records might be created. Uh, 
Uh, so there's, uh, when we talk about the history of the country, we need to have sort of a, an outline of what happened with the country. So we know, first of all, how far back to look for records, because we might want to know when they all started taking, keeping records. And secondly, we might want to know about some of the bigger changes that occurred so that we can uh, understand the context of where our ancestors lived and, and what they had to go through, as well as the fact that we uh, need to know if the records have been destroyed or whatever happened to the records. So these are all sorts of things that are tied up with historical facts. And I'm not going to go through a great uh, detailed history of, of England, for, but you need to know a little bit about the country. And the first thing we know is that clear back in the 6th century, uh, the country was inhabited by Britons or Celts. Now, the Britons or the Celts spoke their own language, and from all accounts, uh, you could probably kind of put them on par with Native Americans when Columbus arrived. They were uh, pretty wild guys uh, from the perspective of the people who came and tried to, to interact with them. Uh, those were the Romans who showed up in 55 BC and conquered all of, of uh, what they called Gaul and what they called the, the part of the world that they in uh, England that they were inhabiting and that Romans were there uh, for quite a few t for quite a few years. Um, then came about 2220 AD <clears throat> it was invaded by the Saxons from uh, Europe. This was one of the Germanic tribes that came across and started pillaging and attacking in in Europe, and, and of course they interacted a little bit with the Romans because the Romans were here with the soldiers. And then in 368 DD, uh, they had a they kind of got joined by a group of, of uh, other another group of immigrants called the Picts, and the Picts and the Sats and the Saxons uh, began to uh, uh, try to take over the Engl uh, the Ireland, the great what we would call Great Britain today, and. By 410 AD, they'd been joined by the Gauls, and so you had the Gauls, the Picts, and the Saxons. So this is getting to be kind of an interesting place here in England because we had Romans, we had uh, uh, Britons, the Celts, that were still, even though they were being pushed out of the country, uh, now we had Gauls and Picts and Saxons who were uh, vying for power with the, uh, with the Romans. And finally, uh, another group, a few more groups showed up. We had Angles, Saxons, Jutes, and Frisians. So if you're, if you're thinking about English as being some kind of monolithic uh, uh, group of people who, who are not, in, in, in reality, the, the English, the, the, whatever you would call a pure Englishman, has got a mixture of all these people in there. Uh, and uh, what, what they've found been finding lately with some uh, big genetic studies they've been doing in England is that uh, the average Englishman is, has about eight or nine different uh, groups of people of their ancestors. So these people are, you know, the English are really a mixture of all these different uh, Germanic tribes that came, that saw the, uh, the, the distance between uh, the islands uh, of Great Britain and uh, the mainland of Europe is not much of a, of a barrier for crossing and for uh, taking over and tried to pillage and everything. So then to add insult to injury, we had the uh, Scandinavians come down in the, in the form of Vikings from Denmark and, and Norway, and they uh, came in in 70, 793 AD. Now let me kind of project this just a tiny bit into genealogy. We have, uh, in, in my experience, I have people who uh, who I look at their family trees, particularly on the family search family tree and some of the other online family trees. And I will see them going back into the dim, dark past in England, you know, into these different kings and things. I'm afraid that's not really very realistic because this is kind of uh, the era when there were no written records particularly for these people. The Romans had written records, but unless your people were Romans, they weren't. These other people were not up in that range. So then we had the, the conqueror, the guy who thought he was going to take over England altogether, and that's Newt the Great, and he was king of England beginning in 1016. So Eng England was part of the Danish, um, if you want to call it empire, the, ruled over by a Danish king. Um, then 
in 1066, we have the most interesting invasion of all, and that was the uh, Norman French who came across the, the uh, channel and uh, under William the Conqueror and uh, sort of rolled up the rest of the, the island. In other words, he began in the south part of the island and just sort of went across and took over everything. So we have uh, a whole series here of various of different people. Now, from the standpoint of our of English history and the, and the language that was spoken, the Norman conquest had an, a tremendous impact on the records that were kept and the language that was spoken by the people in England um, because they mixed it with Norman uh, with the Norman French or Norman background and with what was what had evolved as old, old English. And, and so in America, in English today, we have a whole series of words that uh, are English and have French derivatives. So at the time when Norman, the, William the Conqueror came with the Norman invasion, the, all, of the, all of the ruling class of the people spoke French. All of the, uh, the lower class people spoke what was then called English or what the English people called who are speaking. So for example, you'll have uh, the word for pig, uh, which is a, uh, a German word, comes out of the Germanic part of the English language. And then you'll hear pork, and you'll have ham, and then you'll have uh, all the different words for everything, in, and all the common things have two sets of words. They have the French set and the English set of words. So. This is reflected in the records, and it's some of the things that make life really interesting by trying to do research back any, any further than some of these periods of time. It becomes a, a major, major uh, uh, undertaking. OK, so here's, I don't think they really look like this. I mean, I, I just can't believe that this is what they look like. I, I'm sure they looked a lot less. Uh, muscular and probably a lot less organized even than this. It looks a little disorganized, but I would assume that this isn't quite what had happened. But uh, this was Julius Caesar invading Great Britain in 55 BC. Uh, somebody took this picture, but I'm sure they had to doctor it up on Photoshop. I don't think this is really what they looked like. So basically, uh, we have the, the, the uh, conquest. And here's this little map here shows uh, the kind of the, the path that was taken by the uh, Romans to, uh, to conquer uh, the country. And uh, eventually, um, they gave up, by the way, uh, when they got to the northern part of the country, what we call Scotland today, and um, ran into the remnant of the Picts and the, uh, the Britons, the Celts, and everyone else that was up there. And so they built a wall, kind of like the Great Wall of China, only not quite as fancy and not quite as big, uh, all the way across the country and set up a series of forts to keep the, uh, the kind of un un unwashed group up there in the north out of the, out of the settled part where Rome, Rome was in charge. So you have this as kind of a benchmark. And this is called Hadrian's Wall, and it was built in 122 AD. And it's still there. Uh, but it still that doesn't keep anybody out anymore. I mean, they can drive their freeways back and forth between this, but Rome didn't have those freeways. Uh, finally, in 383 AD, Romans got out. They just simply gave up. Um, but like all things in Europe, uh, there's still there some of their walls and their buildings and, and forts and all sorts of things are still around. Uh, just sort of stuck in the middle of the big cities that look modern, and you're driving around in your car, and all of a sudden there's this Roman fort sitting there. But anyway, so this is, this is kind of the thing. Now, in 4, 449 AD is about the earliest time where we have uh, uh, kind of a written language in uh, Old English. And this is the Old English alphabet. Um, there was a runic called runes, runic alphabet before Old English. Um, and this, uh, just to be quite blunt, uh, if you're going to do research back this far, if you think this is how far you can trace your ancestry, uh, you've got to be able to read this stuff. So, um, you know, this is a, this is one of the major challenges of trying to get back into this time period. So we're going to jump ahead to 1066 AD with the Norman conquest. 
And uh, then right after William the Conqueror got here and consolidated his uh, forces, he decided that he needed to start levying some taxes so he could support all of him, all of his uh, efforts once he got to, to England. And so he sent out his tax collectors to compile a list of all the all the people who are, were potential taxpayers in the country. And uh, uh, it's called the Doomsday Book. And I, I think that the English thought that it was doomsday when they had to pay taxes to somebody from France. So that's kind of the connotation that it was kind of like the end of the world. They were going to, they were going to um, count everybody. But this is the earliest, the really the only, practically speaking, this is the earliest uh, kind of comprehensive record we have of English, uh, of anybody who lived in England. And uh, there are a few people who can track their ancestors back to the Doomsday Book. I've, I've recognized that as a possibility. Uh, they'd have to be related to royalty, uh, and they would have to be work, you know, to landowners, the manor holders, uh, somebody that was recognized by the king. But it is possible to, uh, in some instances, to go back this far. But that's about it, folks. That's uh, you're not going to get much further back uh, because of the Romans and the and all of the other people. You remember I, I mentioned that uh, that Newt, the, uh, the conqueror, came in and uh, took over uh, from Denmark. So there's uh, some serious reasons why the records are not not too easy to decipher going back further than this. So this, by the way, was written in medieval Latin. And it's uh, basically wanted to know how much the king at the time was now Edward the Confessor how he would uh, have, uh, how much money he would be able to pump out of this, out of these people, basically. And then we jump up to 1150. 1150 is kind of the cutoff date for Old English, and we move into Middle English. Um, it's very possible that a few, uh, few people out there have uh, had to had to read Chaucer. Uh, Generally speaking, if you had to read Chaucer in, in school, you probably read a translation of Chaucer and didn't read it in the Old English, I mean, excuse me, the Middle English, although there are Middle English texts of Chaucer out there. Uh, my wife was an English major, and she used to quote it to me in Middle English. Um, so there are a few people out there who can read Middle English. Uh, it's not that, it, well, let me just that's that would be a, a that would not be a good kind of thing to say that it's not that hard to read. Uh, it is a little bit challenging for most people to pick up anything that's back in old in Middle English. But remember this: that all the records at that time, if you had whatever records are available, are probably in Latin and they're not written in Middle English. Chaucer is is famous because it just happened to be composed in Middle English. Uh, the oldest, oldest part uh, written uh, piece of literature comes out of England is Beowulf, which was back in Old English, uh, I mean, way back. But these aren't helpful too, too very helpful word for genealogical research. Um, just to check, so you understand a little bit of the process here in the history, and this, of course, this history is pretty well tilted towards the the concept of understanding what was going on from a genealogical standpoint. Surnames became hereditary in the 1200s and the 1300s. That means that beginning in 11, whatever, in, in 1200 in the 13th century and in the 14th century, the, um, the British began to adopt the, the policy of having surnames. Now, what did they use before surnames? Uh, most of the countries of the world, by the way, and, and England and uh, Scotland and Wales were no exceptions, had, a, had a, a, a series of names called patronymics. And in some cases, they even had matrilymics, which were uh, taking the mother's name. But in most of Europe, it was the father's name. And uh, we always think of countries like Denmark and Sweden and Norway as being patronymical because they had, uh, j you know, Jens, Jens' son was Jens' son, and if he had a son named Ovi, his son would be named Ovi Jensen, and then if he had a son, 
his son would be named Lars Ovis son and so forth so the the given name of the father became the beginning of the of the of the surname with the with the ending added on uh, and maybe perhaps you re recognize that in English we have things like Robert's son and Peter's son and John's son and there's quite a few of those. Those are all patronymics. And before this, they were all patronymics. So when you go back before this time period, you're going to be running into English records, if they exist, uh, that uh, reflect this patronymic name change in every generation. Um, and not quite as consistently as it was done in, in um, um, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. Now, before anybody gets excited about this, the, the, ans the, the real concern here is when is the practical limit for doing research uh, in, uh, for people, uh, common people? Uh, it, discounting uh, the fact that, uh, you know, I acknowledge the fact that kings and queens had children, obviously. So there's a lot of these some people that are related to them. But interestingly enough, uh, there have some, been some very concerted studies in, in Europe about the royal families. And the royal families are very conservative. And the answer is that if, you are, have, if you're truly a royal family, you probably know it because your parents were, were royal and your grandparents were royal and everybody else was royal. There's the very extreme conservatism here because the families never married outside of their group and they never... And they, and they just preserved this up until the present time. So as somebody that's royal today's surname goes all the way back, they know who exactly who they are and who their parents were. So this idea that you can tag in so uh, easily to uh, royalty, it's possible. And it is something that happens. Um, but uh, a lot of times that's not, uh, it's a tradition that's been handed down that perhaps is not, um, not, really uh, able to be proved. And the practical limit for most families in going back in time in England is the uh, research limits that we find. And that's what I'm going, that's what I think is important to understand. The first one, of course, is that very, very few people can accurately trace their pedigree back to even 1066. That's sort of the end of the road for most pedigrees. And then after that, most people but most people can't get further back than the 1700s or even the 1800s. That's you. You get back to early 1800s and the early seven and the late 1700s, and you'll happen happens with many of my lines. The records just simply disappear. There are no records after. Uh, I have a family now that just basically disappears off the face of the earth in 1780. There's no no mention of them in the parish records. There's no mention anywhere of the family. They're just gone. And so that, that just can happen, and it happens more frequently every time you go back another 50 or 100 years or so. So by, by 1550 is my kind of ballpark cutoff date for, for making any kind of further headway, uh, although there are few parishes in England that you can go back a little bit further. And in this case, the research opportunities sometimes depend on the rarity of your surname. Um, and when what we're talking about with a rare surname, uh, there's a program that we'll talk about here in a, just a minute called Find My Past, which is a big uh, British great uh, database for England, Scotland, and Wales, and Ireland. And um, if you do a search for a database in that, it'll give you the number of records that they find with that particular surname. That gives you a, a general idea of the uh, popularity or the co uh, how common that particular surname is. And uh, over the last couple of years that I've been doing that and looking at uh, lots and lots of different surnames for people and and of my own family, I uh, I've seen surnames in which there are two or three million p records for that surname. Any common surname like Jones or Brown, uh, anything like that is going to have millions and millions of records, meaning there are millions of people within, in England that have that surname. Uh, the least that I've ever seen is a very rare surname uh, 
uh, I don't happen to remember it offhand, but it 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 I do remember that there were only about a hundred people in all of the records, all the millions of records on Find My Search, who had that surname, and it was uh, something that began with a Y, uh, that was quite unusual, and uh, so all these people came from the same place, and so it was easy because I could say, well, yeah, you're related to every single one of these people. <laughs> <laughs> because anybody who had that surname would have to have been re uh, related, um, and then that would be a difficult question: would be how, where did they come from? You know, where did that particular group get their surname? Uh, the basic record here for all of this information are parish registers. Now, a parish is a division of the church, and um, for practical purposes here, uh, the the change from the Catholic Church over to the uh, Church of England uh, was accomplished by William the by excuse me Henry the Eighth, and that change, uh, although it created a, a a new set of records, the English the Church of England records, it did not uh, disrupt the uh, the system that they had for parishes. So the records, if they exist, uh, probably don't exist much before the time that they began to be ordered to be. T kept by William, by, excuse me, by uh, Henry, uh, King Henry VIII. And that particular cutoff date is 1538, where, um, oh, I've got seventh, I'm sorry, there's another typo there, it's really Henry VIII, um, issued a mandate to the church to keep the parish registers. Uh, they didn't listen to him by and large, and many of the parishes is still not uh, kept records until uh, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I, not the one we have now, but the Queen Elizabeth I basically ordered them and said, well, that's fine, we'll just take all your property if you don't supply us, don't keep keeping records. So they saw the light and decided that it was better to keep parish records than it was to have the Queen come and take everything away from them. So they they began to keep records pretty, pretty uh, uh, generally. Now, depending on the parish, now a parish is a geographical area that surrounds a particular church, a cathedral church or a church, and um, they were parishes are the smaller of two geographical areas. The larger area was called a diocese, and the diocese was presided over by a bishop, and the parishes were presided over by a priest. And so these were the records that were kept on in both at both levels by parishes and by uh, the bishops at the at the diocese level. So there were a lot of different records kept. Uh, they are very good records. Uh, they're very consistently kept. And the only thing that usually happens is that it's your ancestor that's born when the record wasn't being kept. So it's it gets to be pretty frustrating sometimes, but. Uh, by and large, this is the, the base, basic uh, place where you would go to pick up records. So later, uh, as Queen Elizabeth reiterated the law, and, and, uh, and then after a few years, everybody was pretty well complying, and, and a lot of parish registers started to be generated. Um, so hence my kind of generalized 1550 as, a, as an easy-to-remember cutoff point. Uh, there's going to be a few exceptions, but uh, uh, and and one of the things, by the way, that that the uh, that seasoned researchers will say immediately when they hear me say that is, oh, but you know, of course, there were probate records uh, before that, and I go, yes, they go back further than that. That's correct, but none of my people even had enough to even think about probating anything. They were what were being probated. They weren't the the owners. They were the ownees. They were the guys that were that were getting bought and sold there in England. So um, it's interesting, no, because nearly every line I have ever researched in England ended up with my ancestors being agricultural laborers, which means that they were the serfs. They were the, basically the people. They were called free men, by the way, uh, which is always a contradiction in terms. They they were free in the sense that they, they could uh, uh, pay taxes to the king, essentially. And uh, in order to make sure that you're not just, you know, looking for something that doesn't exist, you need to check to see where the records begin in any particular parish. Now, fortunately, there are exhaustive reference books that tell us uh, every single parish in England, 
and tell us exactly the current state of, um, of knowledge about the very earliest records that are available. And then they will tell you whether which the earliest date for birth records, the earliest date for marriage and burials and uh, all the other records that may be in existence in that parish. So going to these reference books and the online reference uh, type books, you can uh, figure that out pretty pretty uh, reasonably. This is the this is one of those uh, books. This is the uh, the book that's called Fillmore's Atlas. Uh, and the Fillmore Atlas is on Ancestry.com. Uh, it's kind of buried down in there. If you look for it in the in the uh, card catalog, which is the listing of all of the um, records, it's actually called the uh, Atlas of Parish Registers or English, English Atlas of Parish Registers. But we refer to it as Fillmore's because that's who compiled it originally. It's actually been kept up to date. In other words, new records as, as they are discovered are incorporated in this particular work. And what you do if you zoom in on these records is you see each of the parishes, sort of a general outline view of the map of them. And then the number that is there is the date of the earliest records that are available for that parish. So you know what your cutoff is in doing research back in any one of the various parishes. Now, one of the things that you need to, to um, understand is that the parish may have changed. It may have been uh, created or, or from another parish, in which case there may be earlier records in another parish, or it may have been um, dissolved, and so the uh, information that was kept in the parish may have moved into some other parishes. So that's also uh, re recorded in these books that have their Fillmore books and on the online records that have um, these histories of each of these parishes in England where you can look through and find the records. Um, the question of royalty. Um, this is an interesting thing and, and um, a lot of people uh, can tell me over the, you know, I've heard people over and over again tell me how they are related to such and such a king and, or a duke or whatever and uh, that they've traced it back and they're absolutely related to these people. And that is, that's possible. I, I'm not in a position usually to, to argue with any one person uh, about it. Uh, the only thing that I would observe is from a standpoint of a genealogical uh, observation is that these kings were sort of fast and loose about who they were really related to and who their parents were. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, not as reliable as you might think to go back through royal lines uh, because they, ne they didn't necessarily, oh dear, nobody really wants to hear me say that, this, that they didn't tell the truth about who, they, who their parents were. But this was uh, uh, not uncommon. Um, you, you know, if, if there's a couple of TV shows that have been on for some time. There's one new one that just uh, started not too long ago called The Crown. It talks about Queen Elizabeth, the current Queen Elizabeth, and uh, and uh, Prince Philip and all of all of the people in the court. And then uh, before that, you had a, a program called Downton Abbey, which went for years, and everybody was watching that. Not everybody, but a large number of people watching that. Both of these talk about royalty and talk about the, the people who were uh, titled people in England. And if you just, uh, you know, the, the one thing about the, both of these is that you could, you, there were questions about who the parents of all these people were. <laughs> that was, from a genealogical standpoint, generally a, a, a pretty, pretty interesting question. Now, from the United States, if your people are in the United States and you trace them back, uh, unless you're, uh, you know, you descended from somebody who came over uh, quite recently, and you have a different kind of challenge in proving your relationship. But uh, if you're going back to New England and you're talking about who uh, who are you um, related to, and you've traced it back to somebody, there are what what are called gateway ancestors. A gateway ancestors in America is somebody whose whose connection with the royalty has been. Uh, prove to the extent that most of the professional genealogical people accept it as being uh, it's something that 
is already there. So basically, in America, all you have to do is prove your connection back to one of these gateway ancestors. Once you do that, then you can basically claim that your line goes back to English royalty. So this is, this is kind of the place where you get to. Um, this is also just kind of an observation. Um, this was a comment that was made to me by one of my friends who is a uh, who is a very very competent, probably one of the probably the best uh, genealogist that I'm aware of today uh, that I have uh, that I know personally. And I would uh, and his comment to me was it would be real helpful if more more of the people of those on the online family trees would correct their pedigrees to conform to the most reliable consensus of who's related to who. And that is not very difficult information to find, that there are websites out there that show the relationships of all of these royals, the royalty. In fact, the entire list of royalty are on FamilySearch.org. There's a, 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 a heading on FamilySearch.org that says genealogies. And a part of that is what's called community trees. And part of the community trees pro program is all of the, they've incorporated the latest up-to-date list of all of the royal houses of Europe. So if, you know, there's a database right there. It's searchable. It'll tell you exactly who's who in the, in the, uh, in the realm of England and European royalty, including England. OK, so what about crown copyright? This is something that always comes up with doing English research. Uh, it's a form of copyright claim used by the government of a number of common, commonwealth realms. It, it, uh, there's crown copyright in, in Australia and, and New Zealand and Canada and, and other places. And basically what it is, is it provides a special copyright rules for the crown, uh, the government departments and state entities. So in the United States, we get used to listening to the idea that if it's the federal government, they don't have a copyright. That was set up because of the way the Constitution of the United States was set up. Uh, that didn't happen in England. And as a matter of fact, the Crown still claims a copyright to a lot of documents that we would think would be of long ago in the public domain. Uh, they do have a claim to the copyright to the King James Version of the Bible. And so if you want to do an official publication of the King James Version, you've got to deal with England's copyright and uh, whatever they're going to charge you for, for the privilege of printing there another copy of the King James Version of the Bible. Um, practically speaking, the, the, the effect of this is that many of the civil records that genealogists are used to finding uh, in the United States for free are in fact, subject to the crown copyright, and you will have to pay uh, a fee to get the to get an official copy of the document uh, from the government. This includes birth records, marriage records, death records, and all sorts of things. It all depends on the years and uh, which records the government has made the claim for the copyright, the crown copyright claim. And as I mentioned, the King James version of the Bible is subject to the crown copyright. And another thing about it is um, the British copyright law of 1911 abolished common law copyright. So in other words, uh, in England, your only claim is if you if you fit within the, the provisions of the copyright law of 1911. So you can't claim that your work is copyrighted by any kind of work common law copyright, meaning uh, just because it, you wrote it and it's original, you've got to comply with the, the Copyright Law of 1911 to have a protection. And then the Copyright Act of 1956 further extended to include uh, original literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic works made by or under the direction of the control of, the, of Her Majesty or a government department. So if if they commissioned a musical or a, a work of art or whatever, then that automatically uh, extended the copyright to those items, even if they weren't directly government documents or whatever. So you have to be a little bit careful here because you can violate that copyright. Now, some of these documents will appear in uh, in websites that you will you will encounter uh, that have copies of British records. 
it will also come up with a use restriction where it says these can only be used for personal research usage and any co any other copies, including putting them up on another website or uh, putting them in a book or whatever may be um, subject to the Crown copyright. So this is an area where uh, if you're outside of the United Kingdom and perhaps the Commonwealth of, or former Commonwealth, you're not familiar with this particular uh, limitation and provision. Uh, one last thing or a few la couple of last things. Copyright sometimes showed by using a copyright symbol, but even if the material doesn't have a symbol, isn't marked anywhere on it that it's under copyright, it may still be copyrighted in England. And this is pretty. Uh, this is pretty well enforced. It's not uh, just sort of a well. We'd like to do it, but we don't. They really are sticklers for or for keeping this stuff protected. Um, so the the bottom line here is that many genealogically significant government documents are subject to the count copyright and only available by purchase from the government. So you're going to run into this pretty commonly. Um, some additional considerations. Spelling. Um, uh, most genealogists, when they get started, are kind of hung up on spelling. I've heard people argue with me and say, oh, no, that's not the way our name was spelled. Our name was spelled with an O instead of an E, or our name was spelled with I-E-N instead of E-I-N. And my answer is, uh, before 1850, nobody knew how to spell. and not even the people themselves. I mean, if you want to look at the, a good example, uh, Shakespeare signed his name lots of different ways. Uh, people would sign their names differently the way they felt sometimes, I think. Uh, spelling is not something that is going to be either consistent or uh, have any kind of uh, binding on who's related to who. So you can get over that one. Now, another challenge, of course, is handwriting. We mentioned, I very mentioned very briefly that there was an Old English and a Middle English and what we call modern English. And uh, of course, handwriting varies from individual to inv individual, but it also varies based on what was being taught to people as they learned to write. And that particular systems, those systems of writing have changed dramatically over the years. So you're, as you go back further in time, you're not only going to find uh, variations in spelling, but you're also going to find major variations in the handwriting. The other thing that's going to happen is place names. And uh, place names in England, just like every place else, have changed over time. And it's uh, helpful to start researching the places that your ancestors lived and be aware of the difference, uh, difference changes in place names as you go back in time. Uh, it's going to become more and more important to understand where they came from as you move back in time. There's two different date styles, uh, old style and new style. And uh, the old style is uh, the, it was the change of the calendar. Um, and that took effect in England. And uh, there are some adjustments that are made at the, at the time of the old and the new style calendars. So that's. Uh, You'll see that referenced in the uh, in notations is the old style and the new style. It'll be a date, and it'll have OS after it, or it'll have a date. It'll have NS after it, which is new style. And uh, so that may or may not affect your, your research, but you should be aware of it. And also regnal years is another uh, issue that needs to be looked at. So occasionally in the books, in the, excuse me, the documents will refer to who was ruling at the time. In other words, the only date will be in the fourth year of the reign of King George or fifth year of King Henry or whatever. Then you've got to go back and research when did this king start ruling and what, when was five years after he, after he or she started to, to rule in the country. So those are some things that you'll have to look at. In addition, of course, we have a whole uh, to the whole British uh, English set of money weights and measurements. Uh, most of us have learned um, the English system of measurements and weights. We talk about pounds and and uh, uh, yards instead of kilograms and meters. Um, 
But uh, today there's a little bit more in the United States adrift, uh, particularly those who have gone through uh, more updated school systems. They uh, probably were taught everything in, the, in terms of the metric system. And uh, the money system is also something that uh, seems a little bit impenetrable to, to people immediately, you know, shillings and pence and pounds and all of the different references. Okay, so those are things you'll have to look into. Uh, you know, without going into any details on any of those, I'm sorry we didn't get into that, but uh, in an hour's time, uh, this is just a kind of a checklist of things that you will have to learn and will have to investigate uh, when you're beginning your English research. Um, these are the records that you'll want to be cons uh, familiar with uh, as you begin your uh, looking at English records. First, first of all, are civil registrations of births, marriages, and deaths. That began in 18, on 1st of July of 1837. That's when the government began recording these things. Now, they're just like most of the places in the United States who, when they instituted civil registration or civil record keeping, um, it didn't happen everywhere overnight. And so it's once again a, a something that you'll need to look at the time periods that any of these records were actually kept. But this is the general date, start date, when everybody should have been keeping civil registration numbers, uh, dates. The censuses began in 1801 every 10 years except 1941 during the war when they didn't have the ability to go out and count people when they were being bombed off the face of the earth by the Germans. So uh, in 1801, and somebody, some of us going to be surprised to hear that because uh, we're told over and over again that the first general census was 1841. Um, yes, but there were censuses earlier, back as early in, in the every 10 years from 1801, so 1811, 1821, and 1831. They just didn't cover very much of the territory and they weren't very helpful, and so they kind of jump over the fact that they existed. Paris registrations began in 1538, as I indicated, and there were, wasn't general compliance until uh, the later part of the 1600, 1500s when um, Queen Elizabeth made them all comply eventually. Now, the other things, the records you're going to look for are churchyards and cemetery records, um, the burial yards, uh, and the cemeteries are extremely uh, important records in, uh, in England and elsewhere. And so these are a place where you would want to go. And of course, there are wills and probate records, and these are also very important. Um, in fact, one of the um, pushing back my own Tanner line, uh, a will uh, and pro wills and probates became a very uh, extremely important consideration. Um, now, on all of these records, there's going to be a question of their availability and where, the, where you can find these records. Uh, mentioning the, the, the larger uh, record repo uh, online repositories, familysearch.org, um, ancestry.com, and find my past, all have extensive collections of, of records out of Great Britain. Uh, and so you can uh, you can find some or some of these records. Now, uh, the interesting thing about parish registers are they're very valuable records, but the parishes uh, for some time now have realized that um, people will actually pay to get a copy of their records, and so they charge. And there are places where the only way you're going to get a copy of a parish register is to buy a, a CD copy or a whatever copy of the parish register directly from the parish. So they do uh, they do do sell and uh, these different kinds of records. Okay, so let's look at civil registration. Uh, civil registration of births, marriages, and deaths from 1837. The census began in 1831 every 10 years except 1901. Oh, this is the same one. I've got a got a, uh, a little bit of a duplicate there. So now we have census records. This is what a census record looks like. Um, they are very helpful. Uh, 
and uh, there are several websites that have published uh, census indexes and records from 1841 to 1911 and their family search that's free ancestry that's a subscription site find my past is also a subscription site the genealogist.co.uk is a, a subscription site and that's one that probably most of the people who are doing research in the United States are not familiar with and Genuki Genuki is um, uh, links to the indexes does not actually have the records and the images and then we have what's called the census finder and they have a, transcripts of some of the English records and also there's freesand.org.uk and there's additional transcripts of some of the English census records so here's a list of those sites that might provide uh, access to the census records. Now this is a copy of a parish register and in the parish register realm what we have is two different kinds of parishes. We have civil and ecclesiastical parishes. The civil parishes are like districts, parts of the counties and the ecclesiastical parishes are associated directly with the church. Uh, so you will see uh, the records primarily through the church. So the church records are where they're coming from, but you need to be aware that there's also going to be met references to civil uh, parishes. These ecclesiastical parishes originated in the Middle Ages when there was a tithe or, or tithe was paid to, sort, to support the church. So they began the process of collecting the names and uh, collecting their maintenance from them, from those who lived in each parish. And uh, the civil, the ecclesiastic parishes were separated from civil parishes in 1597 uh, when they created what was called the Poor Relief Act. One of the big issues back in the early times uh, in England was uh, the support of the poor and uh, there was a lot of movements back and forth as to who who got uh, who had to support these people who were unable to support themselves in churchyards and cemeteries uh, there are a lot of records online uh, this is the national archives uh, in uh, not the united states national archives but the british national archives and this, they have the English burial and cemetery records uh, list of records online and on film. And then uh, there are some others. There's one called deceasedonline.com, which has a big collection of churchyard and cemetery records. Find a Grave um, has made significant inroads in England, and it is possible to find uh, records of English ancestors on Find a Grave and also on BillionGraves.com. Uh, Billion Graves, of course, adds the GPS coordinates for the graves, and that makes it easier, especially if you're going to go to England and want to look up the grave. Um, oh, yeah, I can recommend. There's a question on history books for, for Great Britain. Um, the, there are a number of books out there. Just if you start looking online, you're actually going to find a number of them are done in, in uh, electronic book. You can just find a electronic book version of the book. The book that you'll want to look at for um, uh, genealogical purposes is called Ancestral Trails. If you put that into word to worldcat.org. Uh, it will tell you a library that would have a copy of that near you if, if there is one. Uh, it's worldcat.org is the big catalog and then look up ancestral trails in England and that's the the main genealogical reference book. It's about the heaviest paperback book I have ever purchased. Um, it's I don't remember it's close to 800 pages something like that. This is what a, what the wills look like. Uh, actually, that's easy to read. It, you know, it looks really uh, uh, kind of fancy, but once you take off all those little swirls and things, it's it's actually very readable. Uh, for wills and probates, Family Search. Uh, you look on the large online databases, Family Search and Ancestry, make uh, My Heritage, Find My Past. Uh, basically, these are the ones you would want to to refer to. 
Now, the main British website is findmypast.com, um, and uh, they have millions and millions of records. It's, a, it's an extensive re research, and I would have to characterize it as being extremely valuable for doing research in England because it allows you to do some, uh, some research things that most of the other programs do not. So don't forget the other large online websites of Ancestry and Family Search and MyHeritage. And there's the genealogist.co.uk that is the other one from England. And Genuki, which is another big website uh, for England. That's what we have today. Thank you very much for watching. Remember that these, uh, broad these are coming from the BYU Family History Library uh, at, uh, and that the uh, recordings of these web webinars will be put up on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel, and we'd uh, encourage you to subscribe. Thanks. Thank you very much, James, for your wonderful webinar, um, and thank you for participating with us today. We'd love to um, hear where you're listening from, and if you have any other questions as we end this presentation, feel free to write those into the question and answer box at the bottom. Um, also, if you have any feedback for today's webinar, feel free to let us know about that so we can continue to improve our webinars and uh, continue to make these better. We are posting these um, recorded webinars onto our website and to the, to the um, BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And we'd also encourage you to uh, um, follow us on our social media accounts on Facebook and on Twitter, and so you can um, stay up to date on what's going on here at the BYU Family History Library. Um, Thank you for joining us again, and um, we'll leave this up for just a little bit if you have any questions. If not, we will see you next time. Thank you.